Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining tonight and welcome to Sleepy Hollow. This is your host Nino inviting you to an episode in which we shall be installing NetBSD on an ASUS EEE PC 4G. So while the USB stick is accepting the NetBSD image, and this is just like the body which is waiting for, for the head to arrive and to launch the whole thing. Let's have a bit of a chat about what today's experiment is truly about. So apparently there are a lot of EEE PCs still in circulation and apparently people do love them and don't want to just trash them, but it seems to be hard to find a suitable system. And in my last video, I recommended to you to use Pure Debian, which I still find the most suitable system for this. Yet nonetheless, if that should for any reason not satisfy your needs, I have recommended one of my viewers another alternative, namely NetBSD. Now, NetBSD is a classical Unix type system of the BSD family or Berkeley software distribution and likely its oldest representative in modern days, like still surviving. The BSDs originally stem from developments at the University of Berkeley, which contributed a lot to Unix in general, also regarding, for instance, networking. And the BSDs are marked by having a license different from what you are used to seeing in the GNU Linux world. In Linux, you're having the principle source is open and if you use the, that open source and produce something out of it, then your product must be open sourced too. In the BSD world, things are more based on trust. You may take this open source product and turn it into something, but then you are not forced to necessarily open the source of, of your resulting development. So you could say that the BSDs were more based on trust, whereas the general public license, which we know from GNU, is more based on mistrust. So entities hating each other, but still being able to cooperate. And these are, if you, if you wish to, the two, these were the two large branches of free Unix software in, in the past. And it looks more and more like the GPL principle is just working better in practice, but that does not mean that the BSDs are not very decent systems in their own right. And more famous perhaps is FreeBSD, on which the movie The Matrix got its special effects made, and on which Netflix is operating part of its infrastructure, as well as perhaps OpenBSD, which was also a split from NetBSD, just like FreeBSD was a split, split from NetBSD. And OpenBSD is more focused on all of these security affairs and issues, Perhaps very famously introducing this memory randomization so that buffer overflow effect, uh, attacks become more difficult. So BSDs have contributed their own good part to the Unix world, if not only in code, then certainly also in ideas. And perhaps the oldest still living representative really is NetBSD, whose thing was utter portability, like to be portable on as many architectures as possible. When, when you think of 1993, when this whole thing was like starting to take off, then that made sense like 30 years ago. You were having lots of competing chip architectures. However, it has more and more turned into a monoculture. So, well, that trait turned out to be perhaps not as significant in practice as one would have assumed at the time. However, that left NetBSD with one very interesting property, namely that it is a very clean 
if somewhat raw Unix system. And it is minuscule by standards of basically anything. It does not have any of these like, you know, system D Frankenstein uh, parts which are somehow attached to the rest of the system and, and everything somehow bloating over from all corners. No, it is a primordial system. Uh, wild beast, lean and mean, and, well, actually a very decent operating system. So, given that it is small, like definitely small by today's standards, it is a good choice for our machine here. And it is by far not necessarily something for old machines. It is rather something for machines where, well, size matters. Now, one... One or two things we might get into also during the installation. BSDs are installed quite differently from Linux. You will see a text installer, which will be, however, quite intuitive. And yeah, I shall comment as I go along, to be very open with you. I have never installed yet NetBSD on the EEE PC, so this is going to be an adventure for me as much as for you. So, now that we have the head of our beloved Hessian Horseman, we should be able to begin the installation. Plugging it into a USB port, turning it on. I have zoomed in a little bit so that you have a better view of what is happening. Pressing Escape and selecting to boot from the USB disk. So, here we are having NetBSD 9.3. Uh, NetBSD 10 installation is by the uh, edition is by the way underway, but I just picked a more traditional system for this experiment. We shall now press simply enter to get to the first option, which is the default. And then, yeah, we see a couple of numbers wheezing by and circling, and that means that the booting process has commenced. very fine and I must say aesthetically pleasant I haven't been installing NetBSD for quite a long time and I was not aware that I have switched to such a very nice uh, green or black font now installation messages shall be in English unfortunately though I do have a German keyboard and you may of course select whichever other you have again pressing enter we are coming to the next screen where we're giving the option to do all sorts of stuff. You might actually like the utility menu, should you ever be in difficulties. This is not what we will be selecting, but just so you have a view. You can run bin sh here, so or partition a disk. So these are certain tasks which one needs to do from time to time, and it's nice that the NetBSD installer would permit you to do so, but we just want to press enter on the first one, which is installing NetBSD. Now we will we'll do what is written here. Partition the disk, create new BSD file systems. These are, by the way, not these ext file systems that you know from Linux. BSD it has its own thing. And load and install distribution sets. Now that's an interesting option. See, the Berkeley software distribution is a set of things that you can install. And these things are also split into certain subsets. And you may, for instance, choose that you do not want to install the man pages or you do not want to install the text editors or something like that. I'll try to install everything. But, but it's interesting to note that you might wish to actually get a more minimal system. And then do some initial system configuration. Shall we continue? No or yes. Now, if you would press no, the installation would fail. So you have to switch down and press enter to yes. And then the question is on which disk to install. And I'm just going to press enter because I wanted to use the default 4 gigabyte integrated disk. Now I'm expecting there some unpleasantness because I have raised the RAM to 2GB 
absolutely unnecessary for NetBSD, but that is going to give me some huge swap partition, which will be absolutely unrealistic and I'll need to correct that. Now as to the disk geometry, we press, press simply enter. Yes, this is the correct disk geometry. And then comes a very nice question. Whether to use, essentially, the interesting options are A and C, exist an existing MBR partition or use the entire disk. What does that mean? The BSDs do not necessarily have to use a master boot record, as was the traditional way for systems such as Windows, DOS, or Linux, indeed. Nay, indeed, rather than that, the BSDs can use the entire disk. This is my favorite procedure and has the effect of very quickly tricking the system during booting into succumbing to a very BSD-like way of, well, provisioning the disk. Why is that interesting? Because it allows installation of BSDs onto computers, which would be otherwise hopeless. A friend of mine had one which would change the disk geometry. Like just simply during boot, in the initial moment when the BIOS is capturing the disk, it is getting one geometry, later on it was getting another, and as a result, it was unable to boot. Until I put on the machine BSD with the option use entire disk, because then the disk geometry no longer mattered. Nobody would ask the BIOS anything about it. And this is what we're going to take. Use the entire disk. I clearly recommend that. It makes the disk much harder to mount on Linux. But then again, I don't care. So then we can set the sizes of the NetBSD partitions or use default partition sizes. I propose we set our sizes because I have my suspicions regarding swap. And there it is, 2 gigabyte on swap. <laughs> Are you insane? And TMPFS a quarter of my space. No, TMPFS is getting another swap. Am I even having a swap partition? That, that's a very good question. I mean, I have quite some RAM here. I might give it 520 megabyte just so it has something. And in case I decrease again the RAM to half a gig, then it will have half a gig of swap. And the rest around three gigabyte we're having on a root. That's very good. We can now go down and say go on. And free space will be again around three gigabyte. Hmm. Ah. Could have done certain things, but... Okay, whatever. I could change the the you the like minimal unit size as to how many kilobyte these shall be the smaller you set it the slower the disk but the better disk usage you're having anyway let's just keep with the defaults partition size is okay shall we continue oh yes my man boom overrode whoever was unhappy enough to be there before and yeah it was a lubuntu installation Shall we be using the BIOS console? That means, well, screen and keyboard. Yes, we don't really care about doing anything about serial ports. Do we want a full installation? An installation without X11? Minimal installation? Custom installation? Or abandoned installation? Look, I'm going to go for full installation. Also, in particular, in view of the idea that a user who has never seen that might otherwise be tempted to reference programs and facilities which just wouldn't be installed. So now it is going to install a couple of sets. You see these, here's etc and, and so on and so forth. And we could have picked some not to be taken, but really at our own risk. Instead, we're going to go for the full option. I'm going to put you now on break, and I'm just really hoping that we shall see all sets to be successfully extracted. 
everything went well all selected distribution sets and then made the device nodes and now the system is now able to boot from the selected hard disk to complete the installation sysinst will give you the opportunity to configure some essential things first hit enter to continue let me tell you this before we go on each of the bsds is quite famous for having absolutely excellent documentation I forgot to tell that initially, but they have so-called handbooks. There's the free BSD handbook and the net BSD handbook for sure. Haven't been looking into OpenBSD, but would be surprised if things there would be different. These guides are superior to anything I have ever seen in the Linux world. And in fact, I am consulting them on Linux topics all the same. Like many things which elsewhere are just badly documented that bsds are handling great so don't be afraid of this just just get the guide handy it's gonna be thick it can be on another display and just follow it if, if you have any questions the guide will describe it rather exhaustively so configure additional items as needed don't really care Time zone UTC, again, I don't really care. Change root password, empty. No, I'm fine with an empty root password, why not? Enable SSHD, no. I can do all of these things later. Add a user, finished configuration. Don't need to add a user right now. Yes, etcrc.conf is its main configuration file. So all the things that you would like to be starting up, in particular SSH servers and so on and so forth, are all going into this one file. You can really ex imagine that to be not unlike autoexec.bat on a DOS system. Okay. So let's get into our clean NetBSD system. And let's see what we can do from there. Yeah, it's unmounting and then it will be rebooting. Hello, I'm still there. Please get, get away. Please go away, sir. <laughs> Hit enter to continue. Okay, now we're going to say reboot the computer. Okay, great. And as it rebooted it, we shall be taking out the Hessian's head and just simply select option one or let it select it. Very good. Now NetBSD is in fact successfully booting on the Asus EEPC 4G. So that's totally working. And notice that our device names are different, yeah? WD0B is the swap. W0, WD0A would be the root file system, R meaning raw. So these are unsurprisingly, of course, different device names. I'm really curious to get inside and to see how much space have we got left. Nice and DFH. Would my Z be a Z? Yes, it would be a Z. Took the keyboard. Cool. And I have a meager 900 megabyte used and 2.1 gigabyte free. I can do quite something with that. In other words, I'm having here a successful NetBSD installation. Okay, so I cleared my screen. The installation has been freshly completed. And now we shall be looking at chapter 4, uh, chapter 24 of the NetBSD guide setting up TCP IP on NetBSD in practice. Okay, <laughs> haven't done that in a moment.
What interfaces have I got online anyway? Does it see my interface? No, it does not. Oh, well, that is unfortunate. Okay, so you would not be having a wireless interface. What would happen if I actually put in my trusty TP link? It works on every sort of Linux. So, so this is one of my favorite little gadgets. If I cram it in, well, will that change? Hi, it did, it did notice it and there it is. Oh my god, I love this. So theoretically, I could have... <laughs> I could have now a USB wireless interface, a TP-Link. That's good. So the next thing I would need to do is to edit etc wpa supplicant.conf. Do I even have one? Supplicant. Hey, hey, show you a bit more. Focused, focus, boy, focus. Focus, so conf, have we got that? We do! What is in it? Very nice. Allow VPA to configure, update config is equal to one. Okay. I'm gonna quit this one and I was also told by the NetBSD guide and we will do that with less that there might be in user share you know user is the gate to, to the BSD systems like this is um, the directory layout is a little bit more focused there rather than like many things which would be in bin in linux are under user bin in the bsds so anyway a user share examples wpa supplicant And then wspasupplicant.conf. Let's see how this looks. Oh, that's nice. Okay, here they are showing you essentially how to enter your um, configuration in order to access your wireless network. I shall therefore now copy that file and then I will edit it with my values in, in the WPA PSK, like WPA PSK, the first version. Okay, so this is the one I'm going to use. And I'm going to put here my network name as well as my password. See you in a moment. Okay, before I do anything, let's just copy it over to the correct location. Nice. And now let's edit it with VI. And that's where I now input my data. All right, now that I have input my data, which however, first I needed to copy from my Linux machine. So I borrowed for a second the wireless interface and I'll need to re-implant it in here. Okay, so once again, it has been noted. What are we having here? I should then input, I should activate 
WPA supplicant in etcrc.conf, the central configuration file. Okay, let's do that. V etcrc.conf. Okay, so we're saying WPA supplicant is equal to yes. WPA supplicant is ah, supplicant flags is equal to double quote minus i uh, I think it was well tvn0 I think that was the name of my interface and with minus c etc that is like the configuration file wpa supplicant dot conf And you know, this RC file you, you use for everything, like if you activate some some server like SSH or FTP or something, it would be in here too. Okay. Looks so far good. And let's see, will it start? the wireless network supplicant start as I hope it will it now tells successfully initialized indeed my stick is blinking so ping 8888 can I ping Google's DNS oh gosh no route to host Oh well, ping 10 oh, oh. 138 would be my router. Oh, nothing seems to work. Okay, I'll have to get into that too. Oh yes, we do not yet have a client for DHCP. Again, we are consulting our beloved rc.conf and in fact prior to this WPA supplicant we're going to say here deha client dh client is equal to yes and It is recommended to apparently add also DH client flags is equal to minus NW, like no weight, so it doesn't have to hang on boot if no network is close by. Okay, now that we have this. The other recommendation I read is to write in here. I don't even know whether that will be so necessary, but okay. And now I might as well reboot. Boy, that was more adventurous than it should have been, but I got a ping finally. So I'm having wireless on the machine. Okay, that, that's lovely. And I want to show you quickly what I did to get so far. So, DH client <laughs> doesn't exist here. It's just not installed at all. Like, you can, you can see that it is not even found. 
but if you edit your etcrc.conf that was the startup script then down here this this is the relevant part you're writing D dhcpcd is equal to yes and then you're writing flags and and this urtwn0 is my um, tp-link adapter and you're mentioning it twice once in the dhcp flags and once in the w PA supplicant flags. So that's what you need to do apart from editing WPA supplicant.conf. And, and then I rebooted and finally I had a correct DHCP configuration. So a bit raw, but absolutely doable. Okay, let us continue then. After the network <coughs> comes sort of a moment of truth. Can we start X11? Ha! Huh? And the chapter 9 of the NetBSD guide is proposing that we do X minus configure, which we shall dutifully execute. Huh. Number of created screens does not match number. Hmm. Do we have a xorg.conf.new? Have we got that? Yeah, we do. Okay. Then it is proposing, although we did have a failure now, and I'm not very happy about this, but let's see what happens if we say as it is advised. X minus config rather than configure xorg dot conf dot new <sighs> oh -ho. well if that's not x11 we got pure x11 running so that's actually working. Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, so <laughs> ridiculous as it may look and, and even as it looks as a most primitive way to handle things so far, we're not disappointed. Uh, and then, if this succeeds, you should see a cross hatched background and the cursor in the shape of an X. Try moving the cursor around to verify that the mouse is functional. You can then switch to another virtual terminal or log in remotely and kill the X process. Great. <laughs> or log in remotely. I love their sense of humor. Control out backspace. Ah, it's doing nothing. Okay, okay. Well then, we'll have no other choice but that. Anyway, that was pretty cool. So we have X11. And the next thing to do, sort of, is to get some sort of window manager, right? Because that was sweet, but that is impractical. All right, this is so beautiful. We are now advised to do start X. You will now see something <laughs> which, which is just amazing. Okay, so this is going to start us an X session. And yeah, here we are with a terminal in something called CTWM. TWM is a very classical Unix window manager and C is apparently some more modern version of it. 
I, I love the color. I love the retroness of all of it. And I just might stick with it. I also love that the cursor is really still the X11X. And I have such modern applications here, such as calculator. <laughs> or... A clock. And it's certainly not 2022. Or eyes. You know, this, this thing which is like following your mouse cursor. This is all incredibly, incredibly looking simply. <laughs> I have virtual desktops, right? I mean, this is actually a nice window manager. I don't see an immediate necessity to get rid of it. But yeah, many people will demand something different, so I'm just going to say quit. What a pity though, because I do assure you confidently, <laughs> this is beautiful. This is beautiful. So I read that um, the binary command du jour for getting something in would be package in. I have never used package in before. I think in, in my time when I was using a much older version of NetBSD, I believe it was something like package add, but okay, let's not be too capricious. And they say package in, can I, can I get window maker like that? Uh, there is no package in to be found. Oh well, so evidently I first need to handle my package management thing. Let's see how that goes. Does this package add actually work? It does. Oh, forget. Ah, I think I could package add package in. Maybe that did not work. Maybe I can just get window maker that way. Okay, I think I first have to figure out how package management was working here. I figured out how to do this whole packages thing. Yeah, I, you know, I forgot all of these package in nonsense and just simply went to, to the thing I knew. So you need to export two paths. The one is this path to user package as bin and user package bin and the other one shall be the package path now pay attention that this is another part another different path than the one which is given in the official guide unfortunately this the official guide is giving you a path which on my net psd 9.3 wouldn't work and then after you have the paths, you, you can just export them. All right. And after you have exported them, you can just simply say package add whatever your heart desires. I did package in um, nano because I just like that text editor. And like package add nano and I can Let's say get also a schema interpreter, SCM, just so you see it live in action, okay? So package add SCM after you have done that. And in a similar vein, window maker for a windowing environment. Though actually that installed quite a lot of dependencies here and I'm not sure I can recommend it all as wholeheartedly as I did on Debian. But anyway, that, that is the way you, you're adding packages. And just a brief note, NetBSD has pioneered at the time the so-called package source collection. And this was essentially a system of compiling packages 
on NetBSD, like automatically fetching source files from places, compiling them, building the executables, and going through the entire dependency process. So this is a thing which NetBSD truly has com contributed to. Unixoid landscape, this, this is a packaging system used by many other systems. But on an EE PC, I just don't see that as feasible. By the way, it ended. We now have the SCM scheme interpreter. All right, so there you have it. And you see everything's fine. Control D to get us out of here. Good. This way I also added Window Maker. I also added Nano. And the thing is, beware when you are adding packages that you don't end up with the real building system to build them from source because at your 600 megahertz slow Celeron processor this is simply going to take an eternity nor do I believe do you have really the disk space to do that. You do have a form of C compiler in fact if you say CCV you're seeing that they have apparently packaged something with like these specifications here this comes by default with the BSDs. The BSDs have a C compiler on them, so they are very classic in this. You, you do not have this risk that you oftentimes have in Linux that neither is a C compiler packaged nor do you have any chance of getting one. No, you do have a C compiler. It works. It's just fine. But you don't have the time for that. So, that said, I have now added the window maker windowing environment and I have created a file called .xinitrc in my home di directory and that contains just simply exec.wmaker and if I now say start x I'm expecting to end up in window maker I may end up who knows where I haven't tested that yet actually but let's see, will it be window maker or not? Oh, it is. So you see the familiar window maker environment is here. And I could start configuring things here to look just like in the Debian installation. So what have I shown you so far? I have shown you how to get into the internet, like with uh, this WPA supplicant. I have shown you how to configure the package addition facility, this package lower slash add thing with which you can get things in a binary fashion. And I have shown you how you can uh, do this, how, how to do your X configuration, including creating this Xenit RC file where you can just write exec vmaker or exec whatever other window manager you like in order to get to your window manager. With this, you are perfectly able to actually build a working NetBSD system on your Asus EEE PC according to your taste. Maybe the only thing I should do is to show you what type of device I used in order to get to the internet via USB. Like this is really, this is my favorite kind of wireless chip. And if it is so kind to focus, so it is this model, model TLWN722N. And that's a pretty old model of a wireless adapter. And I have yet to see any mainstream operating system which does not support it. Like, this stick is really, really cool. So, I think that's quite it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that gave you a bit of an idea how to add NetBSD onto your Asus EEE PC. So there you have another choice, which is not Linux. Of course, there's a lot more to be told. We could be talking about what to configure where, what would be having minimal dependencies for what other thing, and so on and so forth. But 
with all said and done, if I say DFH, I'm still having nearly two gigabyte unused and I feel actually quite confident that with the help of NetBSD, an Asus EEE PC could be brought into a usable shape. Indeed, here you are at a fork of several possible types of systems. You could try to go for a browser of more decent nature and you could try to bring it up to speed as a sort of internet usability device. I doubt that would be useful, even the screen resolution doesn't really fit that. Or you could install a couple of nice compilers and interpreters and have a cute development machine. I think actually that's the best solution. Or you could go for some sort of office device. I really leave that to you. And with that, I hope you found today's video helpful. As to the videos on this channel in general, I would also like to make one further mention. You see, in short, you can expect them now in a bi-weekly rhythm rather than in a weekly rhythm. As I would like to get a little bit more time in order to delve back into artificial intelligence. On the flip side, there are a lot of videos in front of us. I hope you will join in here again so that we can enjoy them together. If you're not a subscriber yet, I'm warmly encouraging you to consider it. Until our hopefully not too far away next encounter in two weeks, I'm wishing you a wonderful time. Thanks again for joining today. See you soon. And from me, goodbye.